Good local time, everyone. As some of you know, I was supposed to attend the Tokyo Olympics, but unfortunately, I couldn't make it because of the pandemic. The silver lining, though, is that I have made some friends who are interested in sports. I've gained a lot of knowledge about the games. Now I feel that I have come to a renewed understanding of the Olympic motto: faster, higher, stronger. Or I should say now, faster, higher, stronger, together. After the International Olympic Committee's decision to include "together" as an expression of unity, the same motto applies to the field of digital development. In the past, to strive for faster tech, higher tech, and stronger tech, many countries did their utmost to offer the most advanced facilities and services. To develop the most cutting-edge technologies, and also to nurture high-tech unicorns, but more and more countries are discovering that digital governance policies are like the Olympic spirit. It's not just about nurturing medalists, which is of course very important, but also about bringing people together, which is even more important. President Tsai Ing-wen announced the platform of Digital Nation Smart Island during her 2016 first election campaign, and the Executive Yuan in 2017 launched in response the Digi Plus program for digital nation innovation and inclusion. After her successful re-election, this idea of inclusion was further promoted, upgraded to the Smart Nation program of this year. With the vision of the smart nation, is now labeled by innovation, inclusion, and also sustainability by 2030. This new vision of smart nation 2030 reveals a new direction for our digital governance policy. Any innovation today must be pluralistic and inclusive, with sustainable development as its goals. And this means that it is no longer the case that The government should formulate policies from the top down only. We should not just dictate new development paths for industries. We should not direct people simply to new public services, but rather we should be receptive to building ecosystems of people-public-private partnerships to address the problems guided by the needs of the people. Now, some may wonder how to cater to the needs of the member of the public in our diverse and increasingly evolving society, and whether problems may arise as some issues are prioritized over others. But we need to simply look back at the history of the internet. The internet was not created by the single international organization or by a single standard setter. Rather, this is about people. Coming from all stripes, scattered around the world, working together in an open fashion to establish a internetwork that connects people to each other, and on this interconnected system, they engage in an iterative problem-solving process, inventing new protocols according to our own needs, before gradually forming the internet as we know it. Now, internet is indispensable for social, economic, and political activities in every corner of the world. It's still in a constant state of evolution as the needs of people change. So, indeed, in a pluralistic society, people's needs, just like the internet itself, are ever shifting. But regardless of whether governments are willing to address them, there will always be people, civic technologists. Willing to tackle new problems with digital innovation, so our smart nation digital governance policy should not dominate over or prohibit these attempts, but we should instead find ways to align with them. So this alignment of values, I believe, is the most important, the first and foremost aspect of digital governance: alignment. For example, when the COVID-19 outbreak、uh, struck us last year. Medical grade masks, the most essential PPE, were in short supply, and our central government had to adopt this real name rationing system for ordering face masks. And everyone wanted to know where to buy them, 
And in that time, more than 100 different mask map applications appeared. Our government didn't discourage any of these efforts. Rather, we released in real time the address and also the real time number of remaining stock in each and every pharmacy through open data, keeping the apps up to date. And so in less than a week, through more than 100 map applications for mask availability, people from all walks of life can receive this information through like the messaging app line or with voice assistance uh, through um, the seeing challenged uh, helping apps and so on. And in other words, an alliance was forged between the government, the civic technologist and the private sector. And this allowed us to meet the diverse needs of the largest possible swath of the population in the shortest possible time, and also at the lowest possible cost. This year, when Taiwan was hit again by a wave of infections in May, the Central Epidemic Command Center issued this nationwide level 3 alert, requiring contact information to be supplied when entering and leaving public venues. This is to facilitate accurate contact tracing and exposure notifications. However, the long queues for writing on paper at each shop can be both time consuming and also counterproductive because it increases exposure time in crowded areas. So naturally, civic technologists began prototyping various digital solutions. There's also many businesses in the private sector that start to introduce their own apps for registration. At one point, I had to install like 10 different apps for registration. From these discussions, of course, the developers by the social sector and the private sector gather together and the government was then able to tell in a very short amount of time what was working and what was not. And we rolled out again in three days the 1922 SMS check-in system. This system, while not mandated by the central government, soon became the most natural part of people's lives. And this innovative design by the GovZero, G0V, civic community proved invaluable. People simply scan a QR code using the built-in camera of their phone and send a text message to 1922. So just scan and send. No apps required. Not only is this convenient, but it also addresses many of the concerns of the public. Like, what if I don't have internet access? Well, manually typing out the text message will suffice. What if I don't have a mobile phone, not even a flip phone? Well, one can still choose to write your contact information down on the paper, now less crowded. So with the 192 to SMS system, how do we store the huge amount of data being transmitted? Well, it is stored within the very company, the telecom company, that provides the person's phone service. And it can only be accessed by contact tracers. Everyone can require a full audit of all the access records for 28 days since it's sending because it's deleted after 28 days. All of these considerations are reflected in the second aspect of digital governance, accountability. Accountability in digital innovation puts people's minds at ease because it inspires confidence that digital services will do what they say they will. And also, it will not compromise the privacy of people. And this is exactly why the personal data protection and cybersecurity communities are becoming increasingly important in digital development. Moreover, accountability can ensure that our improvements are made on a rolling basis to be more and more accountable as new challenges arise. For example, a judge in Taiwan found that the evidence in a criminal investigation included some data from the 1922 SMS system and questioned its legality. And following the discussions by the communities, including of Zero, the Ministry of Justice concluded that the 1922 SMS system does not constitute a private communication and should not be accessed as per the Communication Security and Surveillance Act. And following this interpretation, 
specific measures have now been taken by telecommunication companies and the judiciary to preclude communication surveillance wiretapping from accessing the SMS data as reserved for contact tracers. As part of the national strategy for digital development, alignment and accountability are equally important. It is not just about passively allaying concerns, providing peace of mind. They are, of course, important. But equally important is that we should proactively make the results of such people-public-private partnerships a reality. Another example is our annual presidential hackathon. It's now entering its fourth year. It serves as an opportunity for the social, public, and private sectors to work together to come up with innovative ways of linking data across sectors and using digital technology to resolve imminent social and environmental issues. The presidential hackathon does not offer any prize money, but the system designed by those winning teams, they are a short government promotion. The team is invited to be part of our national initiatives and the government assistance often helped the teams finding opportunities for commercial application. As Taiwan's digital minister, what digital means foremost to me then is the stimulation, empowerment of social innovation, increasing the connections between people through technology, or in other words, an emphasis on alignment and accountability. The good ideas under this strategy are taken seriously. Partners can be sought out to work together and this establish a virtuous cycle that leads to innovative, inclusive, and sustainable digital development. Or to put it another way, only when people coming from different sectors, different fields, and different roles join forces can our digital development be faster higher and stronger together. Thank you. Live long and prosper.